Live from Brother Jimmy's on Easton Avenue in New Brunswick, this is the Kyle Flood Show. Your chance to talk Rutgers football with the head coach of the Scarlet Knights. Rutgers with nine on the line. They're coming. It's blocked. blocked. They got it. He's, He's going to go. go. Sideline 20, uh-huh. 10. Adios, compadres. To be a part of the show, call toll-free 855-FLOOD-44. That's 855-FLOOD-44. Now we go inside Brother Jimmy's in New Brunswick. Alongside Coach Kyle Flood, here's Chris Carlin. Along with Eric Legrand, welcome once again to the Kyle Flood Show. Lively crowd tonight at Brother Jimmy's in downtown New Brunswick. Rutgers preparing to take on SMU this coming Saturday down in Dallas, Texas. It is the first conference game of the year in the American Athletic Conference. Coach, great to see you. It is great to be back at Brother Jimmy's. Nothing makes me more upset than missing a week. <laughs> <laughs> well, we missed last week. I missed the foodie. We miss you, and uh, glad I, to have you back with us. I'm, good to, I'm glad to be back here, especially with the food, as you said. I got to get some French fries in me. <laughs> <laughs> more food for me when Eric doesn't come. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's get right into it. A couple of things. We want you to be involved in our program tonight. Give us a call at 855-FLOOD-44. That's 855-356-6344. You can tweet us your questions at our football on Twitter. And also, if you're in attendance here at Brother Jimmy's, we urge you to come on up to the front and ask a question for Coach. Our man Jimmy right here has got the microphone, so just come up and say hello. We'd love to hear from you. We'll get to your phone call shortly at 855-FLOOD-44. Rutgers coming off a bye week prior to that. A 28-24 come from behind victory over Arkansas, and it was a tremendous win, Coach, no doubt about that. And... uh, you know, looking back, I think one thing that really jumped out, the atmosphere around that game was really remarkable. I think it was a, a, a great snapshot of what High Point Solutions Stadium is going to be, a, a true 12th man type of atmosphere. The student section was absolutely sold out and packed. I thought our students did a tremendous job of affecting that game. I mean, it was very hard for them to operate in the fourth quarter of that football game. How hard is it to coach in such an emotional game like that, ups and downs, and then coming back? How do you keep your composure out there? Well, I, I, you know, for me, I'm I'm pretty even keeled all the time, so it's not. I know uh, cool collective coach. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, I try not to get uh, too up or too down in, within the game because I think uh, you know, that's not my job to do that. That the players are going to play in a very emotionally high game, and they did a great job. And, and for us as coaches, it's to make sure that we're getting the next play ready and the next series ready and and managing the situations. And it was, a, it was an interesting game because there were some things in the game we did really well and some others that we didn't. And you could look, look at the statistics from a couple angles and, and see the reasons why we won and, and see the reasons why we, uh, we didn't always perform at our best. Now, I don't know if anybody's asked you about it since, but Eric and I definitely noticed it in the booth. Yes. You were doing your best to get the crowd involved, and specifically the student section. I saw you go down a good 20, 25 yards down the sideline there. It was, it was I thought, a, a great opportunity for us, and, and our students were doing a great job. I just wanted to make sure they understood how critical that situation was in the game and how big of an effect I thought they could have on it. And, and they really responded. Oh, they ever responded. I was so proud of them. And, you know, Eric, I mean, you saw what that energy was like. It was. I was just watching the game and calling it up there, you know. I felt like I was a part of it down on the field with everyone, you know, when you make a big third down stop. I felt like I was out there, too, celebrating up in, <laughs> up in the booth. But that's that energy out there, Coach. How was it like with the players, you know? What, did, what do you think the biggest thing they learned out being in a situation like that? The, the easiest way I can describe it, and I've, I've always described it this way, is it, it's like a tidal wave. And we were fortunate to be on the right side of that tidal wave in the fourth quarter because they just couldn't get out from under it. Well, a couple of huge plays in the game obviously affected it. And the first one in the comeback, down 24-7, you have the big punt return for a touchdown from Janarian Grant. He is this week's Rutgers Touchdown Club Player of the Week. And, you know, it's, it's remarkable. We saw him out at Fresno have the kick return for a touchdown. But you have always talked about this as a punt block team. And you have two huge punt returns in that game that played a huge factor, not only the touchdown, but obviously later on as well. 
So take me through that. When you're a punt block team, and then all of a sudden you have this young man make these kind of plays, how much of that was predicated on him? How much of it was predicated on the blocks being set up, all that? I, there's no doubt any time one goes all the way back or goes back as significantly as it did, it's going to be a combination of all those things. But I think what people who are curious about it need to understand is when you're a punt block team, there's really three ways that you can affect the play in a positive way. Certainly the most obvious is to block the punt. And we've done that uh, more times than any other team in college football over the last five or six years, I believe. But the second way is you can, set it, you can have a great return because the punt team is so concerned with blocking that they stay in longer than they normally would. And then the third way is really what happened on the one that went for a touchdown we didn't get there to block it, but we pulled up the roll punter a little bit short of where he wanted to be, and because of that, he kicked it across his body to the other side of the field, which really affected their coverage lanes, and Janarian was able to expose those on the return, and, and so I think certainly we would love to block every one of them, but that's not the only way that we can get, get done what we want to get done. Are these all game planned into it, Coach, or is it kind of feel through the game when you want to send somebody or you just think about, all right, maybe I want to do a pump block here or just set the guy back and let's get everyone back and give Janarian the chance? You know, there's, there's a, they're always game planned, but I think you have to have the ability to ju adjust within the game, and we are always going to try and block more than we want. You know, so we're gonna, we are, we are going to try and block that punt, scoop and score, and, and try to get it all done right on that play. Our telephone number, 855-FLOOD-44. That's 855-356-6344. You can also tweet us your questions at our football. Gary Nova in this football game finishes with 346 yards, three touchdowns. Coach, you know, we have talked about his growth over the last year and a half. I really thought this was a big game where he really took a step forward because in that first half, and you talked about it with Fooch at halftime, you were having some protection problems, and Gary really hung in there very well. He did a good job. And we had some drives in the first half that were good drives. You know, we had three good drives in the first half. Unfortunately, we only scored on one of them. And we had a turnover, we had a missed field goal, and then we scored before the end of the half. So it's not that we didn't move the ball. We really felt like we could move the ball. We knew we had to do some things better. Certainly got to protect the ball better. Uh, we got to protect a little bit better. But it does not surprise me when Gary performs well in the fourth quarter because – he loves that moment as much as any player I've been around. Do you see Gary good with his play, especially with the offensive line, when they're in situations after he's been sacked a few times? Do you see him on the sideline go to them and talk to them and tell them, I need the protection in order for me to sit back and throw the ball around? Do you see him get with his team and, you know, try to pump them up and motivate them and not get them down? He does. He does a great job of keeping everybody around him, you know, moving in the right direction. And, and he's demanding of those guys. He's one of the leaders of the offense, him and Brandon Coleman, voted captain by their peers. So, his, his peers have appointed him to that role, and he embraces it, and he's done a good job with it this year. On defense, uh, you had a couple of guys really make some terrific plays that Kevin Snyder played exceptionally well. And a guy who's here tonight as well, Quentin Gauze, had a terrific game with Q, three tackles for a loss. Q Sounds was, was, uh, was, was excellent in the game, and, and Quentin is, is one of the hardest working players in our program. And because of Jamal Morrell's injury, he's got an opportunity now to step in, and now he becomes the starter. And that's how we've always felt here. When somebody goes down, the next person in becomes the starter, and, and they embrace all the standards and expectations we have. And, and it was a game where Quentin really excelled, and he made some tremendous, tremendous plays, a third down tackle on the sideline where he ran down the guy with the ball. It was, uh, it was very impressive stuff. And, but it's not surprising because if you're with Quentin every day, you see how hard he works and how hard he prepares and I think the coaching staff knew it was just going to be a matter of time and opportunity before we saw it. I have a little story about Quentin, actually. I remember I think he was a junior in high school at the time, and I was hosting him on one of his visits, and we were up in the recruiting pavilion, and his dad came up to me and challenged me in a Madden game. And back then, <laughs> I, I was a big Madden guy, so I had to use my Denver Broncos, of course, and he used his Miami <laughs> Dolphins. I, I'm sorry, Cube, but I had to 21-year dad in the first half. But <laughs> it was a good game, but I, I remember we go, we go way back now, me and Q. <laughs> Well, you know, Coach, at the other linebacker spot, I mentioned Kevin, and he's, he's slid back and forth between the weak side and the strong side. Evaluate Kevin for us and being called upon to be a little more versatile as well. Yeah, Kevin's a, Kevin's a luxury for the coaches, coaches on defense because he, he really can do so many things. He could play all three if we needed him to. You know, we, we have not needed him to, uh, but we have moved him back and forth between the strong and the weak side, and, and he does a great job mentally every week of preparing himself to do both jobs 
And, and then when he gets an opportunity to make plays, he's got all the physical tools that you want a linebacker to have. He's a big, strong, physical linebacker who can run to the ball. And, and, and the fact that he mentally can handle the load of doing two positions it, it makes him very valuable to the defense. And as I was watching the game, I saw Lorenzo Waters coming down a lot of the time, yelling to the linebackers or showing Deer Barnwell, he yelled, just yelling to the corners exactly what to do. Can you talk a little bit about how he's played a huge role now into going into the defense and getting everyone lined up and seeing things that other people don't see out there? Well, when you got young corners, you yell a little bit more. Yes. <laughs> There's no <laughs> doubt about that. Probably yelled a little bit less when Logan was out there. Uh, but, uh, but, that, but that's okay. That's what he's back there for. Uh, Lorenzo is, the, is the, the returning starter back there. He's the guy with the most experience. And as you know, with that kind of experience and investment and playing time in the past comes responsibility. You know, it's his responsibility back there to make sure everybody gets lined up. I think every week Jeremy Deering does more and more of that with him, not for him, but with him. And, and that communication between the safeties and the corners and the safeties and the linebackers and then ultimately the linebackers and the defensive line, that's what makes great defense. And speaking of great defense, they came in having rushed for, on average, 275 yards a game. You limited them, uh, much under that in the neighborhood of 100, if memory serves correctly. And when you look at what you were able to do in stopping the run, and it's always one of the tenants, the first things that you mentioned, why were you so effective in that game? There's no doubt that that starts up front. And to hold two running backs like that under four yards of carry, is a tremendous accomplishment. I felt we would be challenged in ways we hadn't been this year, and we were, and I thought we responded. But if you don't win the battles up front first, none of those things can happen. And we had some great linebacker play, and, and Lorenzo and Jeremy and T.J. Johnson do a great job of, of helping it with their run fits and support. But if you don't win up front, it's not going to be less than four yards of carry. That I can guarantee you. So those guys up front, I thought, did a tremendous job against a big, physical, strong, and very talented offensive line for Arkansas. And as we're talking about up front, how is it a challenge that so many people talk about how big and, and strong they are? How do you find your advantage with the defensive line when you come with smaller guys out there trying to get, shoot through the gaps in order to get TFLs? I think it, it's what we predicate the defense on. And, and I know you asked that question for the show, but I know you also yeah. know the answer. Yes. And, <laughs> and for us at Rutgers, the way we play defense has never been predicated on size. It's always on speed, quickness, athleticism, the ability to change direction. And probably more important than any of, any of those, toughness. And I think we've got that. I have to give my D-line some respect, Coach. You know, <laughs> I, know that. I know that. We're going to do a whole show on the D-line. <laughs> uh, one last one on the game, and it was a, an unfortunate situation, losing Paul James to injury. Uh, fans certainly want to know his status. Where, where are you with Paul right now? You know, Paul will be out for the next two games. And, and I'm not saying he'll be back in the, in the game after that, but the way the season lines up, we're going to play this game, and then we've got another one, and then we've got a bye week. And I think when we get to that next bye week, we have to reevaluate where he's at. It's a, he'll certainly be back before the end of the year, but when exactly, I, I don't know that I can say that just yet. You know, yeah, you'll start Savon Huggins now this week, and I thought at the end of that game, Savon came out and had some terrific tough running to get the first down to ice that game. Uh, what did you see from Savon when he was in there? It, it, that type of thing never surprises me. You know, Savon has done it for us in the past. Uh, I... I was, I was proud of him for going in the game. At the end of the game, he had not had a lot of touches at that point. And that was a point in the game where they knew we were going to run the football. We knew we were going to run the football. And yet we were still able to. And I think that is the sign of, of not just a very effective running back, but an effective run game in, in, uh, in general. Do you see any more pressure now coming on Goodwin now with P.J. down? Do you see now Savon's going to be, of course, carrying the low, but now you need other people behind him in order to give him a break every now and then. I don't know if it's pressure. I think if you if you spoke to just guys like Justin Goodwin and Desmond Peoples, they're they're chomping at the bit for the opportunity. Nice. You know, they you know those running anybody who's carried the ball as much as guys like Justin Goodwin and Desmond Peoples have, they, they want the rock. You know, they, they want a chance to carry the ball and show what they can do and and now they're gonna get that. And they're also gonna have to do all the other things a running back has to do. He's gotta be able to run the patterns, he's gotta be able to pass protect for the quarterback. So there's a lot of things that go into being a great running back on top of being able to effectively run the football. Let's get to our first tweet of the night. This is from GQ Zoolander. Of course it is. <laughs> Coach, is the dear Barnwell coach to play the run so aggressively, or does he work more on instinct when he attacks the line of scrimmage? I don't know if I've ever been around a, a, a player who plays at a high level who doesn't have good instincts. Uh -huh. Now, do we coach our players to, to be physical? We certainly do. Uh, you can't play great defense without being physical, and I think we have a history at the corner position of having very physical players from Devin and Jason McCourty 
to Logan Ryan and guys like Nadir Barnwell, and I think you'll see some other guys before the end of the year who are going to be physical corners, guys like Lou Toller, Anthony Chaffee. I think you'll see that in all of them. Uh, Nadir is a guy we thought was going to play at a high level when we recruited him. Uh, I don't put a timetable on anybody, but I, I'll also tell you I'm not surprised that it's sooner than later. Uh -huh. And sometimes with the corners, you know, they have to set the edge of the defense. They have to come and stick their head in there. Do you teach them to go low on the line or just man up and have to set the edge? You know, it's, it's an interesting question because they've changed the rule this year. Really? A and you can't just go low anymore the way you used to. You have to, you have to be face-to-face -face or between 10 and 2, as the officials call it with the offensive lineman who's coming to block you. So those guys have to be physical, and you're right. You know, the, There is no such thing as a cover corner at Rutgers. You've got to be a complete football player to play in our defense, and, and sometimes that means being the force player on defense or the guy who has to set the edge. We're going to take our first time out of the night. We want you to get involved in the program. As we said, you can tweet us our questions at our football. You can also give us a call at 855-FLOOD-44. That's 855 855- 3566344 or if you're in attendance tonight here at Brother Jimmy's come on up front and ask your question for the coach we are live on scarletnights.com and on 1450 WCTC we'll take a quick time out this is the Kyle Flood show Excuse me is that your diet pepsi Sophia Vergara Hi, uh, yeah, I, this, uh, <clears throat> this is my diet pepsi I love diet pepsi Do you love every sip uh, nothing is better than drinking a refreshing Diet Pepsi and just reveling in its crisp, delicious taste. Well, you know what they say. If you love something, let it go. And if it comes back, it was meant to be. So I should set this Diet Pepsi free and wait for it to come back. Then it'll be more delicious than ever. Would you hold my Diet Pepsi for me? I'd love to. Thank you. What happens now? Go, get out of here. It can't come back to you if you're standing next to it. Thanks, Sophia. I'll wait for you, Diet Pepsi. The only thing better than an ice-cold Diet Pepsi is a free ice-cold Diet Pepsi. Love every sip at DietPepsi.com. This is the Rutgers IMG Sports Network. For over 20 years in New York City, Brother Jimmy's Barbecue has been serving up great times as well as some of the best barbecue this side of North Carolina. And now Brother Jimmy's is opening in downtown New Brunswick on the corner of Easton Avenue and Wall Street. Planning a party? We have private rooms to suit all your needs. Or let Brother Jimmy's Catering bring the party to your office or home. So come on down to Brother Jimmy's and put some south in your mouth. For reservations and event information, visit us at BrotherJimmy's.com. Brother Jimmy's Barbecue, located at 5 Easton Avenue, New Brunswick, New Jersey. See y'all soon. Rutgers football fans, it's time to join the 1,200-plus members of the Rutgers Touchdown Club in supporting Rutgers football 365 days a year. To become a member, please visit us at RutgersTDClub.com. Your membership includes regular meetings with Rutgers football coaches, discounts from local vendors, bus trips and giveaways, and a whole lot more. It's time for you to show your Rutgers spirit by joining the Touchdown Club today. Also, please support the team by purchasing 50-50 chances prior to each home game in the stadium parking lots. Visit us at RutgersTDClub.com for more information. Go Rutgers! Back on the Kyle Flood Show at Brother Jimmy's in downtown New Brunswick. Rutgers getting set to take on Southern Methodist this Saturday down in Texas, in Dallas. We've got our first question from uh, one of our fans here in attendance tonight. Sir, what's your name? Where are you from? Hi, my name is Jacob. I'm from Teaneck, New Jersey, and I'm a member of the Rutgers Riot Squad. Nice. nice. What's up, Jacob? So I was wondering, what's the mind frame of the team when conference play starts with two huge road games like this season? Well, I would tell you, first of all, I appreciate the Riot Squad. I love you guys. Yeah. You guys are awesome. Yes. Now, the Riot Squad, you guys made a decision to not just have a picture of my head but you blew it up five times its original size, which is one of the more terrifying things I've ever seen. So I, I, I question your judgment as an organization, but I do appreciate you. Uh, this is what I would tell you. When conference play begins, it's a great opportunity for us. And the 2013 football team has an opportunity to take this program somewhere it's never been. And the only way we can do that is to win this conference and win the automatic bid to the BCS. But when you say two games, I. I don't think in terms of two games. I can only think in terms of being 1-0. and 0. 
because for us to do what we want to do as, as a football team, we have to be 1-0 this week. So our focus this week is on being 1-0 against a really fine SMU football team. Thank you very much. It is an interesting proposition, though, given the fact that you have such a short turnaround here. So as a coaching staff and with the team, how will you handle that? It's something that we, we have already planned out as a coaching staff. We, we don't really need to, to talk to the players about it. We'll talk to them about it after the game, and then you know, we'll put the plan in effect. But we had the bye week before, and then we've got a bye week after. Mm -hmm. So we've mapped it out all the way through. But right now we're in a normal game week, so the, the, the players don't they, – they're on a need-to-know basis, and that's just something they don't need to know. What is a coach's mindset going on that there is no championship game, and now each week that going into it is – Pretty much, you know, this is the, on the line. If you, if you don't win this weekend, you know, it can come back and bite you in the butt. You know, you want to ha have your own – control your own destiny. So how tough is it, you know, as a coach going into mindset knowing that each week you have to just go out there and put it all on the line, especially in conference play? You're exactly right. And for us, we have nothing left but conference play. And because there's no championship game in this conference, we every week becomes a conference championship game. And we found out last year you know, in our game versus Pitt – Ultimately, had we performed better and we had opportunities and we didn't take advantage of them, but if, the, if that game comes out in a different outcome, then we win the conference before we even play the last game. So you don't know which one is going to be the difference. So every game that you play in conference play is a conference championship game. Once again, our telephone number is 855-FLOOD44. That's 855-356-6344. Another fan in attendance. Young lady, what's your name? Where are you from? Hi, I'm Holly White from Milltown. Hey, Holly. How are you? Good. Um, my question is, does the weather affect um, when what play you're going to make, like to the, tell the boys what to do, like if it's really windy or if it's cold? Does that really affect what, what you're going to you know, call or no? It can. I think the weather can have an effect on how you call the plays on offense. I think the the one that has the most effect or more of an effect than any other uh, weather condition will be wind. You know, really, rain is not much of an issue. They, they, there's enough rotation of the footballs that they stay fairly dry. So, And it's not even that. The football doesn't get slippery? No, like they change them in and out, and the officials do a good job with them. I think the wind probably has the greatest effect on the game in terms of how you call the plays and how you manage the game because special teams become critical in a windy situation. And the, one more question. Like, um, are the football players really allowed to have uh, long hair? Like, like, is that, like, allowed? Really? Like, is that, like, are they allowed to grab their hair? Because I noticed in some of the games that I remember one game that the guy's hair was actually pulled on. And that, is that fair? Is that legal? I want to say that was the 2008 Louisville game, Jay. Jordan, Jordan Brooks. Brooks. Yeah, no, Jordan Brooks had one of his dreadlocks, yeah, much like yours, Eric. <laughs> Should we try it again and see what it feels like? Not just to that. test it out. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, they, there's no rule against having long hair. Uh, we, we've had more than a few players who, who've actually had it. And oh. I have seen players tackled by, tackled by long hair. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Got another question on Twitter here. Coach, uh, this one is asking for one young man in particular on defense. Coach, are we going to see DeLon Stevenson get some more playing time soon? I think it's still very early in the year. And DeLon Stevenson is somebody who's taking reps with our defense right now. And it will not surprise me at all. We are certainly getting him ready in anticipation of playing this year. Uh, another question was about kind of the short turnaround that we talked about. This one is from Drew Feldman on Twitter. How tough it, will it be to get ready for the Louisville game so soon after SMU? He talked about having the bye week in, in between, but with that being the case, uh, how much of it has to be done in advance of this game from your standpoint? We actually do things for the whole season in advance. Yeah. Yeah, during the off season, we, we do uh, preliminary scouting reports and things like that, but there's nothing more important to this football team than being 1-0 this week. Yeah. And, and I understand the fascination uh, of, of the fans with the schedule and things like that. But as a football team, we just don't concern ourselves with it. We, we, could, we can only play one opponent at a time. Uh, we, as coaches, we've done our due diligence. You know, everything we need to do for the season that we could have done is done. So now all our focus goes into being 1-0. And, and when that game is over, we'll turn our focus to the next opponent. Has the temperature this week played any factor, you know, helping you out knowing that you're going into Dallas? It's going to be pretty hot down there. Everyone knows how it is in Texas. So this week has been pretty hot up here. It's been pretty nice. Has that played in any role into, you know, preparing for this game coming up? I like it when it's warm out of practice. I think so it, it just I. creates one more thing, one more challenge for everybody on the field to have to deal with and, and, and to continue to make your team and your players and your coaches more mentally tough. So... Uh, the weather has cooperated for us this week. 
Uh, but I think we're in, we're in excellent condition. I don't, I don't see that, the heat or anything like that being a factor. Got another question from another member of the Riot Squad, Coach. Yes, another member of the Riot Squad, Nick Mariani from Lincroft. I was just wondering how your game plan will change without Paul James for the next two games. The game plan really won't change. You know, the, we are always going to start with running the football, and, and we are determined to run the football. And, and everything we do offensively really comes off of that. And I think I really believe it's the, it's the run game that allows the quarterback and the receivers and the tight ends to be so effective in the passing game. And I also think it's, it's minimizing the run game of our opponents that allows our defense to do well and allows the defensive lineman to, to crank it up and get sacks. So philosophically, nothing will change. But every every team that's that's performs at a high level on offense, there's no doubt that the ball has to go to your best playmakers, and those playmakers have to earn those touches. And as they do that, the ball will come their way. Thank you, Coach. I, I know that you're constantly evaluating and constantly assessing, but with the bye week and you're now one third of the way through the season, how do you assess where this football team is? I'm pleased with where we are. I think we've got a lot of a lot of, of room for improvement as we go through the season here. But but here's what I'm pleased with. I feel like we've gone through four games and we've been challenged in every way that we're going to be challenged for the season. I think we've played teams that spread it out and throw it a lot. We've played other teams that, that hunker down and want to run the ball right at us. So we've had to deal with both of those extremes and a few things in between. So I don't think there's going to be anything we'll see down the road that we haven't already prepared for. With that being said, I think this week is a tremendous challenge for our defense. It's, it'll really give us a benchmark to see how much we really have improved from the first week. We've worked very hard to improve, but now these offenses aren't identical, Fresno and SMU, but they're a, they're a lot more similar than they are different. So I think we'll get a chance to really see how much we actually have improved. And as we're talking about getting playmakers the ball, can you talk a little bit about how Tyler Croft had a coming out game versus Arkansas last year and now this year too? How big of a role is he going to play this week? Yeah, the John Mackey Award winner of the week, yep. which is a, a tremendous honor, a, a tremendous honor for a tight end to, to receive. And we're really proud of Tyler's game that he played and, and all the preparation that went into it. So, you know, he, he is a guy who continues to get better and better. And the reason he gets better and better is because now he's not just – a young guy who can really catch the ball and run. He's a, he's a true tight end, and he can work in the run game, which makes him even more effective in the passing game. Coach, look who's back. This is my guy right here. This <laughs> is my question. man right here. Another question. My brother from another mother. There he is. <laughs> Good to see you guys again. Uh, just uh, remind everybody your name and where you're from. Oh, yeah, I'm Scott. I'm from Long Valley, New Jersey, also a member of the Riot Squad. Very proud of that. Uh, my question goes back to the Arkansas game. Uh, you had that huge play on 4th and 12, You go uh, down by 10, you go for it, Gary hits Carew for the touchdown to put you within 3. What was the mindset going into that instead of kicking a field goal to make it a 7-point game? Gary told me if we went for it, it would be a touchdown. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I, I, you know, that part of the field, we actually were against the wind. And I thought the degree of difficulty for the field goal at that point, I, I, I wasn't crazy about it. I thought we had, it, we had an opportunity to complete it and convert the fourth down, even though it doesn't seem like a high percentage play. It's just what I felt better at at that point. Did I think it was going to go in the end zone? Well, I sure, it was sure nice that it went in the end zone, but I felt like we'd have a chance to convert it, and that was really the decision. Worked out nicely. It sure did. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. Scott, Thank great you. to see you again. Uh, I like the headband. Headband's looking good. I'll tell you. I, I could use that. That's all right. <laughs> hey, Coach, um, that being said, where are you? Where do you stand right now with your kicking game with Nick Borghese and with Kyle Federico and maybe a third member now creeping into it? Sure. Between uh, between Kyle Federico and Nick Borghese, we'll make a decision after tomorrow's practice as to who who will start the game with the field goals. And then I think if we're going to attempt one that's a little bit longer than we have, we probably would use Nick Marsh. That's what we've been doing this week in practice, and he seems to hit those the best right now. I don't know if that'll be the case uh, in the long term, but but again, we're just we're going to do everything we can to win this game, and. And then we'll move on from there. You know, I, I, don't, I don't know that you'll see a situation where Nick Marsh becomes our full-time place kicker only because it's never been done in the history of the NFL. And there's a reason why. It's just very taxing on the kicker, and he's done such a nice job on kickoffs and punting. He's a weapon for us right now, and I, I don't want to take away from what he's doing in, the, in those areas. Do you see if it's a little bit even better to have a competition during all weekend practice? Because you know you're going to get your best out of every kicker all week long because they're the one who wants to go out there and kick the field goals. They all, all three of them want to be out there kicking, and they're competitive guys. And and Kyle Federico and Nick Borghese have both proven to me that they can do it. 
We're just in a little bit of a funk right now. We've got to get back in rhythm so that we start making those field goals. Uh, one last thing I wanted to ask you. In relation to the Arkansas game and, and, and this past week, too, it was great to see Danny Garofalo out there at the Arkansas game, one of your honorary captains for the coin toss. That's right. Let's hear it for Danny. It's great to see Danny Garofalo right here in the He's audience. Here tonight. And, you know, we talked about the coaches wearing the armbands for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And, uh, you know, this past week, everybody across America did it, raising awareness, you know, the people getting an opportunity to help out. What did it just mean to you personally to be able to help in that regard? It is uh, it is a personal charity to me because we have a relationship with Danny and, and his parents, Dan and Jen. And Danny's a friend of my son's, and they actually share the same birth date, not just the day of the year, but the actual year itself. Wow. So we've watched them grow up together over the last nine years, and, and, and their friendship has grown. And anything we can do to bring awareness to this so that we can tackle it and remove it from these young boys, we're going to do it. Do you see yourself getting into more, you know, charity, charitable things? There's so many, there's so many things out there, Coach. Do you see yourself looking into more opportunities to help other people with, you know, the platform that you do have? There are so many good causes. What I've tried to do is to do as much as I can, but I, I, I try to do things that I can be involved in. I don't want to want to do things in passing and i'm sure you're you're having to deal with some of this as well as oh, yeah. you get invited to speak at different places and and there are certainly certain charities that are very important to me and coach to cure is right at the top of the list the new jersey special olympics is right at the top of the list uh, there's an organization that my sister's a part of in new york ddi developmental disabilities institute of new york that is at the top of my list so there are certain things that we have been involved with so far that I have been able to do. And, and if I have the time to do it, then I want to do it. Our, our telephone number, once again, 855-356-6344, 855-FLOOD44. You're listening to WCTC in New Brunswick, 1450, and on com. We'll take a time out and come back. More of your calls and plenty of your questions on Twitter, at our football, and we will discuss Rutgers getting ready for the run and shoot and SMU this coming Saturday. This is the Kyle Flood Show. You may already know that AT&T is the nation's fastest 4G LTE network. And now independent researchers confirm that AT&T 4G LTE is also the most reliable. Whether you're connecting with family or getting the job done, you want a wireless network you can count on. AT&T, the nation's fastest and now most reliable 4G LTE network. Rethink possible. AT&T reminds you to never text and drive. It can wait. Speed claim based on national carrier's average 4G LTE download speeds reliability claim based on data transfer completion rates on nationwide 4G LTE networks. 4G LTE not available everywhere. Between home and a dingy hotel room two time zones away. Between the 10th and 11th hour of travel. Between swollen feet and an aching head. There is a cold, refreshing, complimentary bottle of water. Because you, friend, are in exactly the right spot. The parking spot. The airport service that reminds you where you park matters. Learn more at theparkingspot.com. We have airport parking covered. This is the Rutgers IMG Sports Network. What's up, Rutgers? Y'all ready for some football? Brother Jimmy's in New Brunswick is your headquarters for Scarlet Night Football, as well as your home for the Jets, Giants, and all your favorite NFL teams. With over 30 HGTVs, we serve up all the NFL action on Sunday and Monday nights with amazing food and drink specials all game long. So come on down to Brother Jimmy's and put some south in your mouth. For reservations and event information, visit us at brotherjimmy's.com. Brother Jimmy's Barbecue, located at 5 Easton Avenue, New Brunswick, New Jersey. See y'all soon. If you needed brain surgery, you wouldn't ask your family doctor to do it. You'd choose a brain specialist. At University Radiology, our radiologists specialize too. Whether you need an x-ray of your knee, a digital mammogram, or a brain MRI, University Radiology will match you with the right radiology expert to help your doctor make the right diagnosis for you. University Radiology helps keep the Rutgers athletes in the game. We can help you stay on top of your game. For more information, visit universityradiology.com.
We are back at Brother Jimmy's in downtown New Brunswick. This is the Kyle Flood Show as Rutgers gets prepared to take on SMU this coming Saturday. Well, Coach, let's talk a little bit about June Jones and Southern Methodists. They do run the run and shoot. So tell us a little bit, having worked in the run and shoot before, the principles of it, and I guess first of all for, for fans that watch the Fresno game, you mentioned it's different. How is it different? I think the, the Fresno style of offense is uh, is a little bit more similar to some of the gun run offenses that are being run these days and not necessarily the pistol of Nevada, but you know it has some elements of that and some elements of what they do at Oregon and, and some elements of the run and shoot also. I, I don't think it's, devo- it's void of those things, but I think that you know June Jones is one of the innovators of the run and shoot. You know, when people think of the run and shoot, the first two names that come to mind are Mouse Davis and June Jones. And he took it all the way into the NFL, so it doesn't. It does not, in any way, surprise. We got. We got to take a little bit of a, 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 a time out here. We've got. <laughs> we've got Celebrity Night here. Jimmy Dumont and brother Jimmy. Jimmy Dumont is here, and Kevin Haslam and Ryan Blazik. Goodness, guys who have helped Rutgers University to more than a couple of bowl games, and they've come here to say hello to Eric. And I, I think, in a nice way, although I can't really tell right now, Eric, if these guys even <laughs> like you. All right, we have a question from Kevin Haslam. Hello? Okay. Hi. What's going on? How's everybody doing? The show has taken a detour, ladies and gentlemen. Yes. My fault. I apologize. What's, what's, what's the question? I thought you were going to ask us a question. Asking, oh, you asked me? I thought you asked me a question. Um, you put me on the spot, kind of. What do you recommend to eat right now? I'm okay. Kinda, I'm kinda, I'm kinda Here's what a, I recommend. Issue. When you come to Brother Jimmy's, there, there's nothing on the menu that, that you won't really enjoy. But here's what I'm going to tell you. You see my guy Danny right there? Yes. Danny has sampled everything on the menu. <laughs> oh. And he can tell you exactly what to order. Danny, help what me What is out. your choice, Danny? What do you want Kevin to have? What do you think? Anything. What do you think could possibly make his arms bigger than they are right now? <laughs> <laughs> Don't hype him up. Small coach. shirt. <laughs> <laughs> All right, back to, back to June Jones. Right. I appreciate you stopping by, Kevin. Um, how about a, a round of applause for some Absolutely. former players here? That's how <laughs> Uh, but, uh, you know, <laughs> goodness gracious. <laughs> <All right> <laughs> uh, but to get back to what I was saying, uh, when people think of the run and shoot, they think of Mouse Davis and they think of June Jones. And June Jones is, the, is, the, is one of the innovators of it. And I think it's a little bit of a misunderstood offense. I think people, when they think of it, all they think of is the passing and it being a pass-happy offense. But as I've said to other people, a lot of those passes that are between zero and eight yards – are their offense's version of the run game. Yeah. And, and they're determined to put you in space and, and create one-on-ones. And, and that offense ultimately is predicated on their skill players being better than the players trying to tackle them. And I'm glad you brought that up, one-on-ones, Coach, because as you think about one-on-ones, how important is it now to get the guy on the ground on the first tackle? Because if one guy misses, it can really spring for, for a 40-yard run to even more, Coach. You're exactly right. And, and that... that Everybody's got to be disciplined in what they do. And, and then when you get an opportunity to tackle, you got to use the tackling system, as you know, and, and you got to get that player on the ground. And when you're able to run to the football the way we can, you should get a second and third player there and hopefully create some turnovers. So he's got uh, – Coach Jones also has Hal Mummy on his staff, who is a former head coach at Kentucky. He is uh, the passing coordinator for the offense. So with Coach Mummy, they, they have uh, called it the run and raid. I guess the con- the combination of the two. So is it different than what you've seen as the traditional run and shoot? I think every every time you see a version of it, it's going to be a little bit different. Okay. I, I always attribute that more to the players than, than the schemes. Uh, but I, I always remember a quote that Mouse Davis uh, used when they asked, and they said, Coach, what do you do when the run and shoot's not working? And his quote was, you keep on running and you keep on shooting. <laughs> so... Uh, <laughs> I don't doubt that they are completely dedicated to what they do on offense the way we are, and, and we're going to have to play a 60-minute game to come out 1-0. How big is it now going to be able to get pressure on Gilbert back there, the quarterback, getting in his face and causing him to maybe we get some confusion back there and not want to throw the ball down the field and keeping those runs to zero to five-yard passes? Exactly right. I th- and I think it's going to be critical that we're able to get pressure on him with, at times, three defenders, at times four, at times five, and at times six. Because I think if you, if you try to do it the same way the entire game, th- their coaches are too good and their players are too well-trained. They're going to get you. Coach, this question comes from Twitter. Are you Army ROTC 1766? Coach Flood, 
How much longer until we see Janarian Grant on the fly sweep on offense? Hashtag give him the rock. <laughs> Hashtag have we run the fly sweep this year? <laughs> um, I, I think he's lobbying to be the offensive coordinator. i got to talk to Coach Prince about this gentleman. Here. Let's see if maybe we want to bring him in for an interview. But uh, Janarian Grant's a, a very special player, and he's, he's doing some tremendous things for us right now. But we've also got some other pretty – Talented players on offense, guys like Brandon Coleman, guys like Karan Pratt, uh, guys like Leonte Crew, Ruhan Peel, Carlton Agadosi, uh, Andre Patton. They're coming. You know, so uh, whether or not we uh, we give it to them on a fly sweep or throw it to them within what we actually do on offense, um, I, I do think at some point this season you're going to see Janarian Grant in, in the offensive rotation. Uh, and I'm excited to see that as, as much as I think this gentleman is. Now, Eric mentioned Garrett Gilbert. This is an interesting situation. For, the, for those who uh, hear the name, and it sounds familiar, well, for a couple of reasons. He's the son of former NFL quarterback Gail Gilbert, who's a longtime backup with the Buffalo Bills, uh, among other teams, Chargers as well. But a few years back, he started at the University of Texas back in 2010. And in fact, for those that remember the national championship game against Alabama, a few plays in, back in 2009, Colt McCoy got hurt. He had to come into the game and played the rest of that game, uh, finished up that game, I believe it was 15 out of 40. It was a true freshman at the time. A uh, couple of touchdowns, some interceptions as well. But this is a guy with an awful lot of playing time under his belt, then transferred uh, to SMU. So what traits does he have as a quarterback? He's a big-time player. There's no doubt. He's a player who's going to play in the NFL when he's done playing in college. He's got everything you want in a quarterback. He can make all the throws. He's got a big arm. Uh, he's athletic. He's elusive. At times, they run him with the ball. But he's also got the most important quality, which is he's an excellent decision maker. And that is, is something as a quarterback, I don't know if it gets spoken about enough. He, this guy understands how the offense works. He doesn't put his team in bad positions. You know, they went out and, and won a bowl game last year in Hawaii against Fresno State. I mean, th this guy is a he is an, an excellent, excellent quarterback. Can you give us, give us some tips on basically how – Defensively, you see some of the things that they do out there. How is that going to affect you on offense? How, can you, you know, just elaborate a little bit on how they are defensively and, t and tell us, what you know, offensively, what can you do in order to get past them? You know, they're a 3-4 defense, and they, they do a fair amount of pressures. Now, more often than not, you're talking about four- and five-man pressures, and they do a little bit of, of zero blitz. Uh, but what they do on defense and how you call the game at times is affected a little bit about by what they're doing on offense. And I think we saw that in the Fresno game where when you end up in a game where the scores are going back and forth, you might be a little bit more aggressive in what you're doing than, than another game where if you're fortunate enough to be in the lead and you can control the game and shorten the game, you know, those types of things happen. Coach, the Riot Squad has come out in full force tonight. We have another question. We are question. pumped up about the Riots. We've got Riot Squad. We've got alumni. We've got rock stars like Danny Garofalo here. <laughs> this is a big night here at Brother Jenner's. <laughs> Hi, I'm Christine. I'm from Sicklerville, New Jersey. Um, that is I, the home of Timber Creek High School, yes, if I remember correctly. Coach yes, Henson. Yes. Yeah. Um, I know Rutgers defense prides itself on being uh, like stopping the run, but how do you adjust to uh, a pass-heavy offense for this game? I think it's important. The first thing is, even though they choose to throw the ball, they will run it, and at times uh, it's in, with June Jones as the head coach, they've run it very effectively. So I, I don't think you can discount that. We still have to start with what are the core values of our defense, which is stopping the run is, is going to be primary. And then as long as we do that, we can force them to be a little bit one-dimensional. And then we've got to be multiple on defense. You can't just line up and play one coverage. You can't just line up and, and play one blitz or one front against a team like this because they're too well coached. The adjustments will come too fast, and they'll put you in very bad positions. So we've got to try it in every way we can as we stop the run to also keep them off balance as they try to throw the ball. Thank you. And also keep in mind this week they're getting back their primary starting running back, Traylon Sheed, who got hurt in their first game of the year a few weeks back. So we'll see if he becomes a bigger factor in their offense. We'll take another time out. We've got a couple of callers lined up. 855-FLOOD-44, 855-356-6344. Get your questions in for the coach as Rutgers prepares for SMU this Saturday. Another break. This is the Kyle Flood Show. <laughs> Excuse me, is that your Diet Pepsi? Sophia Vergara, 
Ah, uh, yeah, I just, uh, <clears throat> this is my Diet Pepsi. I love Diet Pepsi. Do you love every sip? Uh, nothing is better than drinking a refreshing Diet Pepsi and just reveling in its crisp, delicious taste. Well, you know what they say. If you love something, let it go. And if it comes back, it was meant to be. So I should set this Diet Pepsi free and wait for it to come back. Then it'll be more delicious than ever. Would you hold my Diet Pepsi for me? I'd love to. Thank you. What happens now? Go, get out of here. It can't come back to you if you're standing next to it. Thanks, Sophia. I'll wait for you, Diet Pepsi. The only thing better than an ice-cold Diet Pepsi is a free ice-cold Diet Pepsi. Love every sip at DietPepsi.com. This is the Rutgers IMG Sports Network. Is your commute to Manhattan leaving you frustrated and light in the wallet? If you live in Monmouth, Ocean, Burlington, or Middlesex counties, say yes to a direct, affordable commute with Academy Bus. Enjoy stress-free travel aboard one of our Wi-Fi-equipped buses straight to Midtown or Wall Street in Manhattan. We'll deliver you to your commuting destination relaxed and ready to take on the day, and you can also use the Wi-Fi to get some work done. For schedules, park and ride locations, and more, visit our website, www.academybus.com. Academy Bus. We know the way. When I say Xerox, I know what you're thinking. Transit fares, as in the 37 billion transit fares we help collect each year. No, oh, right, you're thinking of the 1.6 million daily customer care interactions Xerox handles, or the 900 million health insurance claims we process. So it's no surprise to you that companies depend on today's Xerox for services that simplify how work gets done, which is pretty much what we've always stood for. With Xerox, you're ready for real business. Back in the Kyle Flood Show, Chris Carlin, Eric Legrand, and the coach, Kyle Flood. Rutgers preparing for Southern Methodist this week. We do want to pass along one bit of sad news, and that's uh, former Rutgers linebacker Todd Holmes passed away. He was 58 years old uh, after a long illness, and later this year he's going to be inducted into the Rutgers Hall of Fame on November the 2nd, along with nine other athletes. He was a, a linebacker at Rutgers back in the mid-70s and a, a terrific uh, player, former team captain as well. And certainly our, our thoughts and prayers right now are with his wife Kay uh, and his children Ashley and Tom and, and their grandchildren as well. So just wanted to pass along our regards to the family of Todd Holmes, the former Rutgers linebacker. As we said, he will be inducted into the Hall of Fame a little bit later this year. We have uh, a couple of telephone calls to get to as well. Why don't we start with Dan in Somerset. Dan, you are on the air on the Kyle Flood Show. How are you? Good, Chris. How are you doing? And Coach Flood and Eric, how are you guys all doing? Good. Doing great. Before I say anything, what I, what I want to say, I just want to say that I will be going to the game down in, down in Dallas on Saturday. So I'm looking forward to it. I've never been to Dallas, and, you know, I'm looking forward to a big win down there. Plenty of flights out of Newark. Yeah. Okay. I wanted to ask a question about targeting. I watched football all day last Saturday, and I saw it called three times. In two of the three times, they reviewed the play and nullified the, um, the, exp the player being expelled, expelled from the game. He was allowed to continue. And I think Kasim Green of our team got called for it once last year in the Pittsburgh game. Correct me if I'm wrong. But... Um, what is your opinion of the call? Explain the call a little bit and your opinion. Uh, Kasim Green was um, was actually called for it in the Cincinnati game. And it was, uh, at that point, the penalty did not uh, initiate an ejection. That's a new rule this year. Uh, the way with the rule has been explained to us is that helmet-to-helmet -helmet contact is what they're looking for. And... The targeting of a defenseless player, a player who is catching the ball in the air. Uh, there are certain, I think, obvious things that, that trigger it, and one of the expressions they use is launching, where a, pr a player leaves it, leaves the ground and leads with the crown of his helmet. You know, those things have always been illegal. They're very dangerous. We don't coach them. Um, yeah, I, I think the officials are, are trying to do the best job that they can, and I, I think it's a very difficult job because the game is played at such a high speed. It's a little bit of an unusual rule. 
that when you have this instance uh, of this penalty that they can go to videotape to, to make sure uh, that the ejection is validated. And if it's not, they remove the ejection, but they continue to assess the 15-yard penalty. So it's a little bit unusual, uh, and it's something we're all going to have to get used to. But the most important piece of this puzzle is, is that the player's safety is the most important part uh, of every football game. And we continue every day to coach our players to make sure that we're doing it the right way so that they're safe as they both tackle and get tackled. And I think if our players play within the system we've given them, those penalties will not be an issue for us. Do sometimes natural instincts you think take over? So like you see a guy in the air and you see somebody like Lorenzo Waters coming to make a tackle. You think instantly, you know, you want to you hit the guy. You may not be targeting him, but sometimes – Ends up head-to-head hits. So how do you teach our coach that? Well, I think I think what I've said to people is, you know, there's a reason why we wear helmets in football, and at times there's going to be contact between one player's helmet and another. I think it's the intentional initiation of contact with the crown of the helmet that they're trying to remove from the game, and, and I think that's a good thing. You know, the play with Kasim Green last year, you can slow motion that play down to a free freeze-frame sequence And when you do it, you can either agree or disagree with the call. And that's what I mean when I say it's played at such a high speed. It's a very difficult task for those officials to to navigate. Well, that being the case, I guess there's got to be that fine line as coaches. And, yeah, you don't teach to to launch yourself or anything like that. But your style of defense is an attacking style of defense. It's an aggressive style of defense. So is it something that in teaching the techniques that you do, that you have to just continue to to drill into the minds of the young guys because it is such a fast-moving game. I, I, I think you're exactly right. We, we train our players, and, you know, I, I see Quentin Gauze in front of me here, and everybody remembers that spectacular tackle that he made uh, close to the sideline last yep. week that, it, that really forced them into a punting situation. And the reality is he used the tackling system perfectly. And if our players use our tackling system the way we teach it, we will not have any issues. It's when players leave the tackling system or freelance where those ty- that type of contact can happen. And I, I certainly, you know, knock on wood, I'm not going to say it's not going to happen, but it, it has not done a, been an issue for us yet this year. Our players have done a good job. And that, I got a question, Coach. When, you at, when the ref throws the flag and then they review the play and say the guy is not ejected, do you think they should pick up the flag and, and you know, after they reviewed the play and saw that he wasn't leading with the crown of his head? You know, that's a, that, that's a great question. You know, you're, you're asking me if I should agree or disagree with the officials. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think that, I, think that um, I, I can't tell you that I could say for sure exactly what the rationale is in terms of removing the ejection but keeping the penalty on. Um, but, but I would say I know the officials are doing the best they can to officiate a game that's played at a very high speed. We'll take a time out. We've got a few minutes left for you to get your questions in for Coach Flood. Put them on the grill as Eric just did. I love it. <laughs> we'll take a quick time out, as we said. We're live at Brother Jimmy's in New Brunswick. This is the Kyle Flood Show. Hey, everybody, this is Coach, and I want all you tried and true college football fans to enter the AT&T Be the Fan sweepstakes. Tackle my weekly challenge, and you might be the fan who wins a VIP trip to ESPN College Game Day. Find out how you can win at attbethefan.com. AT&T, rethink possible. No purchase necessary. Open to U.S. citizens and resident aliens of the 50 U.S. states or D.C. of the age of majority. Ends 11.59 p.m. Central Time, November 29, 2013. Official rules at attbethefan.com. Void where prohibited. To a true fan, college football isn't just a sport. Football Saturdays are filled with big rituals and little rest. It's a day for hard-hitting, heart-pounding, sweat-drenching action. And you must be dressed for the occasion. So there could be no mistake as the who side you're on. Get out there and get the NCAA gear that allows you to wear your Saturday's best. NCAA apparel for all your favorite schools. Available at Walmart. This is the Rutgers IMG Sports Network. Oh, what up, Rutgers? Hey, guess what? I bet you didn't know you're about to have three different kinds of barbecue sauce all over that sweet, sticky mug of yours. Also, bet you didn't know, down south in North Carolina, we can actually make some of the best barbecue you've ever had in your ding-dong life. So come on down to Brother Jimmy's Barbecue and put some south in your mouth. Brother Jimmy's Barbecue, located at 5 Eastern Avenue, New Brunswick, New Jersey. Or check us out at brotherjimmys.com. See y'all real soon. 
When it comes to football, you want your favorite players to stay healthy and on top of their game. Well, AmeriHealth New Jersey wants the same thing for its members. That's why AmeriHealth New Jersey has you covered with the answers you need to understand how the new health care law is changing the way you buy health insurance. AmeriHealth believes the more you know about your options, the less stress you'll feel. No one cares more about keeping New Jersey healthy, and no one is doing more to keep rates affordable. To learn more about health insurance that pays, visit AmeriHealthNJ.com. AmeriHealth New Jersey is a proud sponsor of Rutgers Football. Couple minutes left in the Kyle Flood Show this week. Rutgers preparing for SMU down in Texas. Nice early start, 11 a.m. Central Time, and I know you're a big fan of that. I am. We are a morning program. We are a get-up-and-go program. We are on the practice field before 10 a.m. every day. Uh, we are finished by noon, uh, never any later than that. So I, I think this type of game, is it, it really plays to what our normal schedule is. So as a player, I know I used to like to get up and not have to sit in a hotel and wait all day long for either a night game or 3.30 game. So you think the players are really looking forward to just getting up and getting right after it? I think the players are looking forward to playing in a conference championship game with the opportunity to be 1-0. I don't know I don't know what other motivation you could need as a player or a coach. I think it's going to be a great atmosphere for football. It's a historic place. Uh, their university has had a lot of success over the years. They've won three national championships at SMU. They've had a Heisman Trophy winner at SMU. Uh, they've had some of the greatest uh, football players in the in the history of the game. The owner of the Kansas City Chiefs is an SMU alum. So uh, this is a, an exciting, exciting game for us as a program and an opportunity to be 1-0 in a conference championship game. And they're actually honoring their uh, 83 team this weekend, the Pony Express team uh, with Eric Dickerson and, and Craig James. But uh, that aside, Coach, on the defensive side, Eric touched on it a little bit. Uh, they're a 3-4, but how do they function defensively? You know, they function by, by moving every play, and they're not just going to stay there in two-gap, uh, similar to some of the defenses you might see in the NFL and, and a couple in college, not many two-gap teams in college. But they are going to slant, and they're going to angle, and they're going to pressure, and it, it'll be a, a variety of coverages that they play behind it. But they're aggressive on defense, and, and they're going to force you to put the hats on the right people every play. They're not just going to sit there and, and let you block them. How important is it now to keep your offense on the field for long drives in order to keep their offense off the field so you can get your defensive rest because you know they're going to be flying around all game long? I've heard a lot of people say that over the years, and I've never felt that way. I feel, you know, the primary job of the offense is to score points. Uh-huh. And if those points come on one play, I'm fine with it. Well, and if course, those points come on a 12-play drive, that's great too. You know, I, that part in terms of time of possession – Time of possession has never been a statistic that's proven to win games. There's no number that if you hit it, you win a certain percentage of the game. So I, I don't really think of it that way. Well, that's, I mean, that's fair. You think about all the, all the big games over the years. You think about the Giants and the Bills in Super Bowl uh, 20, uh, 21. No, not 21, uh, 25. And Bills had the, game, had the football for 40 minutes in that game and still ended up losing. Now, we get this every week. Mix it up a little bit, maybe. Your keys to the game this week. Well, I think you're going to like these, Chris. Okay. I think we've got something new for you this week. Um, I think the first thing we need to do as a football team is run the football and stop the run. I think that's where it's going to begin. (laughs) I know that's not something I say every week. (laughs) Right? We weren't here last week, right? Uh, I don't say it every week. Right. Not every week. (laughs) um, But if we run the football and we stop the run, I think we've got a great chance for success on both sides. And, And, you know, I learned today that that was something that Vince Lombardi preached to his team. Really? And, uh, and as a football coach and somebody who does this for a living, certainly we, we try to read on, on the guys who have been successful over the years. But I just came across something today on Vince Lombardi, and, and it, was, it was great because he talked about two things. He talked about winning teams running the football and stopping the run. And he talked about, as a football team, we are what we repeatedly do which is the beginning of a quote from Aristotle, which is in our team room, which says, we are what we repeatedly do. Excellence, then, is not an act, but a habit. And I truly believe that. And we have a long, I have a long way to go, and we as a program have a long way to go to achieve some of the success that Vince Lombardi had with the Green Bay Packers and the other places he was over the years. But, but I think when your core values are the same and you're moving in the right direction, it's certainly exciting to be a part of it. Coach, good luck this week. I appreciate that. Good luck, Coach. Be watching. 
<laughs> Rutgers and SMU this Saturday, 12 noon on ESPN News and on the Rutgers IMG Sports Network. We'll see you next Monday night for the Kyle Flood Show on the short week here at Brother Jimmy's. Have a great week, everybody. You've been listening to The Kyle Flood Show, live from Brother Jimmy's in New Brunswick. The executive producers of the Rutgers IMG Sports Network are George Pine and Ben Sutton. Associate producers Joe Potter, Chris Ferris, and John Willie. Network manager Brad Law. I'm staff announcer Carl Shannon. Special thanks to Rutgers Athletic Director Julie Herman and the staff and management of flagship station WCTC. 